I'm Tanya Fox, and you're listening to Fox Talks Business Podcast. I started my career in the corporate world, but always played to my own tune and love to think outside of the box. This didn't always serve me well with the bosses, so I made the decision to become an entrepreneur. And that little seed of entrepreneurial curiosity continued to grow as I branched out into retail, service, and franchise businesses. Now, I have been fortunate to have amazing successes in the last two decades, but they did not come without some really big failures and even bigger lessons learned. And that's why I started this podcast, not just to share the failures, but to show you how you can turn every failure into a success. We're going to hear from some amazing humans from around the world that are going to share their stories of the good, the bad, and the motivational entrepreneurial life has to offer. After all, life is too short to make all of the mistakes yourself. So why not learn from each other? And of course, we're going to have some fun because as I always say, well, you know what? I'll tell you that at the end of the episode. Hello, Foxy listeners. Welcome to the show today. My guest, Barb Davids, is going to talk to us. This is going to be an episode I know that you guys are going to love because we're not going to fluff stuff up. This is going to be stuff you're going to want a pen and a piece of paper you're going to write down. You're going to be able to take action right away. Barb, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about this subject that I am in love with and passionate about. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean, I've been deep diving you for a bit now and listening to different episodes. We talked about this a little bit off air, but for those that this is their first sort of introduction, give us a little bit of a background of you. So I help small business owners with their SEO. So getting found in Google, essentially, without it being like weird and icky. And I spent so many years like in corporate life and was very put off by agencies and how they weren't very forthcoming with information. And I was like, can you just tell me what you're doing? And they wouldn't. And so I started a business to, and my aim is to keep really transparent about it and explaining the whys, the hows, and the what fors basically around SEO and how it really relates to content marketing, which I never really um, saw that before I started my own business so much, um, how much, how much relation it was and just making it simpler to understand basically. So let's, you know, dive right into this, you know, topic first, I think, you know, one of the questions I think that a lot of people do or bad habits, I guess they do is kind of treat SEO as like a one and done. So mm -hmm. let's demystify that a little bit. How long do you have to sort of pay attention to this? So here's the kicker. <laughs> SEO is a not as long term as I feel like people think it is. So you SEO your website, you do the things that you need to do to it technically, and you put up some content to be found. And then once you're done setting it up and setting like the basis, the foundation of it for Google to find it, then you move into content marketing. And that's what takes a long time. I think that's what gets, gets confusing. The SEOing of your website doesn't take that long to do, but what takes time and patience is waiting for the results of some of your hard work to be recognized by Google, basically. Right. So let's, let's jump right into that. So what are some things, you know, tips that, or maybe some items that are simple things that people can, you know, start doing right away that maybe they don't think of, you know, as they're creating some of their, their content for their website? Yes, I have a great one that people will love. So the easiest one that I talk about a lot is when you're on your Google search results, let's say somebody types in a phrase and it's a phrase that you want to be found for. Let's just type that in. And if you go see, there's a whole bunch of different search results there. If, if you type in site colon and then your domain name.com, so it's S-I-T-E colon your domain.com and put that into Google, you will get a list of only your pages. So you'll get a list of everything um, that Google has in its index, in its database of your website. And it shows the page titles and the descriptions. And so the easiest thing is to make sure that those page titles and those descriptions are clear enough and that they are compelling enough that if somebody were to find that result, they would want to click it. I, I usually say it's like, um, like a shopping window. You know how you have the, the shopping displays? It's kind of mm -hmm. like a shopping window. Is it compelling enough? Does it make you want to step inside the store or step inside the website to see what you have to offer? 
So make those super compelling. And you can do that easily on your own just by going into your pages. It's a little scary sometimes for some people, but it's usually right there. There's a page title, there's a description and make those um, really exciting. And because otherwise what happens is the page title will take usually from the headline of the page, whatever your, your headline is, which is fine most of the time, but sometimes you might want to make it just a little bit more like oomphy. <laughs> and then the, that's a technical term, by the way. Um, and then the description is you, it's nice to put like a call to action. So like maybe learn more. I'm not a copywriter, but like learn more is a little bit less compelling, but like learn the five tips or something like that about if it's a blog on five tips of something. So you'll want to encourage them to take action to want to click on that. So that's probably one of the, the easier ones. And if you don't do that, it will be defaulted to something, but it's always good to put your own spin on it. So yeah. that's one good one. And I think, you know, because I think that people get, you know, sort of stuck in the idea that this is something that you have to have a lot of knowledge on, or you have to, you know, sort of dig into the back end and to weird formatting language that nobody, mm -mm. you know, understands. And so I think that sometimes yeah. people just kind of tend to, sh to shy away from it. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually right there. Um, a lot of the, the websites that are built nowadays, there's a, a you might hear a, a thing called SEO plugin. And so that will have like a whole little area. Uh, Yoast is a very common one. There's some other ones out there. And I would say that it gets kind of a bad rap because the SEO plugins, their their intention is to help you to decide what is good for SEO and what isn't. The, the catch to it is that it doesn't know your specific business, right? right? So like if your page is only 200 words and it says, oh, you don't have enough words, well, then you got to tell the plugin to go fly a kite because it doesn't know what your purpose is for that page. So right. then you just kind of have to ignore it a little bit, but that's probably one of the easiest ones. Some other ones that I think that um, are a little, little bit overlooked as well that are really good for Google is the author bio. So at the bottom of every blog post, if you have an author bio, it shows some credibility for Google that you're a real person. And a lot of the times Word, WordPress, Squarespace, all the popular ones have a like section where you can just click a box and it will automatically show up at the bottom of all your blog posts. So that's a good one to instill trust and credibility with, well, not even just Google, but like the people reading your blog, that there's a real person on the other side. And so when someone is writing that, what type of things should they, is there certain things they should make sure they're always putting in that or are they put in it initially as it's repeating itself? Yeah, they just have to put it one time usually in the back end and then it'll show up every every time. And it's more... I don't think there's any specific words that really make a difference. It's more about the intent or what you want the person to feel when they read your bio. So does it instill trustworthiness? Does it, does it instill like, I know what I'm talking about and maybe a little humor, if you can fit a little bit of that in there, but there's like 20,000 different ways to do a bio. So, right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's talk about, you know, I was, we were talking a little bit about off air and I was telling you that I was listening to one episode where you had, and I'm going to link to this on, uh, in the show notes and on my blog post, cause I did listen. Um, but, um, it, you were talking about 11 different tips that people can do. And one of the ones that for me was like the light bulb that I was like, Oh, I feel like I've stopped doing that was images <laughs> yeah. and the titles of images. Can we talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. That one is a big one for sure. I think, especially in the day of the, you know, the stock images and Canva images and for photographers, they come out of the camera with this gobbledygook file name. So we forget that that actually makes a difference. So image optimization, it's almost like a whole thing in and of itself, but it really makes a difference on the page. It's like, there's those things that you can do on page, which are the images that you have control over in your SEO to try and help Google find your page. And with image optimization, there's three parts to it. There's the file name, the file size, and the image alternative text. And the file name, so when you, like for example, a common uh, scenario is downloading something from Canva and then just uploading it right into your blog post. That file name is going to be whatever the name of the project is, or if it's multiple pages, it's going to be, you might have something on that page title, that might be the page name, but really what you want to do is um, 
before now you would have done keyword research. I don't think, I don't know if we want to get into that necessarily, but whatever topic you're talking about for that page, use that as the file name. So if you're talking about red shoes, do red-shoes.jpg. If you have more than one image, do red-shoes-1.jpg. So that's one example for the file name. And then there is the file size. And this one is also a very tough one because it's not inherently known and the systems don't tell you, but if you download a file that is like 5,000 pixels wide or five megabytes, if you ever see those file names when it's being downloaded and you only need it as a thumbnail, that's too large for the space that it's in. So you wanna make sure that it's sized for the space that it's in. So that's an example of one other way to make sure that it's really, that helps with speed on that side of things so that your page loads faster. And then the third one is the image alt text and it's technically called image alternative text. And it starts with, uh, with the reason that it's there is for accessibility purposes. So when somebody is having the page read to them, the, the, the system thing reads out what that image alternative text is so that it can be described of what they're seeing in the image. So inherently what you wanna do is just say, okay, whatever's in the image, like maybe 10 words, something like that. Make sure to put a period at the bottom, at the end, because it's a screen reader, it's reading sentences or it's speaking in sentences. And then if you can put the topic, red shoes in the alternative text, that's great, but only if it fits naturally because really the first and foremost is to describe what the image is to the person who's listening to the information. So let's do it as the example that you said before of the red mm -hmm. shoes. So if you have mm -hmm. a, a photo, say of red shoes sitting, um, I don't know, at the front on the door. table. Yeah. <laughs> at the front the door. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it could, it could be a pair of red shoes strewn about in front of the front door. Right. Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But so really you, keeping yeah. in mind if, somebody's not looking at that point mm -hmm. in time, well, they kind of get the gist of what it is that they would, yes. you know, can you make them imagine the picture? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. And Google uses that. And that's why it's kind of funny when people say use that as like a keyword area or the topic area. I encourage people only if it makes sense, because otherwise you're forcing some words in there that doesn't make sense to the real purpose of the image alt text area. Right. And so that you don't have to go, you know, too descriptive in that too of mm -hmm. saying, you know, of like getting into the depths where it becomes its own novel. <laughs> right. That would be a little perturbed. perturbed yeah. Perturbing, <laughs> You're like, I get word? it. Irritating. I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Red shoes at door. That's all you needed to say. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I think for a lot of people, you know, when they're thinking about SEO, I mean, the whole reason that, that they're doing it is because you know, like anything we want, we want people to find us first, but we also mm -hmm. want some kind of rate of return on it. We want that mm -hmm. ROI. We want to sort of get it. Can you talk to us about some things that your, you know, the clients that you've worked with, what are some of the things when they've implemented this that has been their R ROIs? So I would say one example is, and part of this is being able to track your information as well and making sure that you can track things into Google Analytics so that you can see how many pages are coming to your website or excuse me how many visits are coming to your website from organic search and then being able to track that to say a contact form so how many people went through the contact form to contact you from organic search and then when you close that lead putting that back onto how many searches you got. So there's like a formula that you can use to see what the return is on there. One of the examples that I like to use is um, the, there was a blog post that we did for somebody, it was like an ultimate guide and they were getting maybe onesie twosie leads per year. And then we did a refresh on it. And then it was getting into the double digits per month for the leads. So just being able to take that one piece and refresh it, kind of like revitalized it for Google to be able to like, oh, this topic, okay, let me put them in front of the people searching for it. So even when you put stuff out there, you might have to refresh it to see a return. Not everything is like right away. I think that's where people get a little bit uh, maybe dissuaded from SEO because it does take so long sometimes to see and have Google bring some information or bring some visits from it. But I'll give you this example. 
there was a um, client I was working with and we did a specific topic and it was just in and around their service. It had nothing to do directly with their purchase. Like it was like more top of funnel, like people were looking for it. And we thought, oh, there's some searches on there. Let's do a blog post on it. Well, then it got a crap ton of content. But the problem was, is that it got so much content, it skewed their numbers and it wasn't actually driving leads or driving sales to their business. So we decided to get rid of the content. So that even happens sometimes as well. So right. kind of an interesting, interesting idea. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, that quite often people will write you know, write something and then it just kind of, you know, especially if it's a blog post or something on their site and then it, it just kind of, you know, it scrolls down the, the list and they don't think of, you know, going mm -hmm. back and even like repurposing of going, okay, you know, yeah. I learned something new or I have a different tip or I have a quicker way around this, you know, let me, let me use this and, and sort of like you had said, refresh it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't have to kind of start from scratch again. Right. And the repurposing is a big one because what that's the, that's the great thing about investing with the copywriting, investing with what you're doing with your website. You can create a piece of content and it's going to be sitting out there for SEO for Google, but then you can take that and you can break it up into pieces and use it on say Instagram. So for example, if I have a blog post that I write monthly, I can take and break it into four different parts create a carousel, create a reel. I've now got two posts per week for four weeks for Instagram for that one blog post. So. Right. And which also helps lead people back to it, which is really mm -hmm. what, what, you know, you kind of want to do. Yep. One of the other things, um, tips that you had given, and I can't remember where I saw this, maybe it was in that episode or not, but I thought it was really interesting when you were talking about, you know, um, when you are writing, you know, a blog post or something about the contact, um, if you're having people to contact you as opposed mm. to linking them over, let's talk right. about that one. Cause I was like, Oh, you're right. I do hate it yeah. when I get jumped around a lot <laughs> and I do yeah. do that to people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is a common one. So when we do our blog posts or we do our pages, we're always screaming at people, contact me, contact me, and then sending them to a whole nother page when you could literally just put your contact form at the bottom of the page make it a little bit easier for the person who's ready to contact you to do it at that moment. Not that they won't still click over there, but it's one less click. It's a little bit less friction. And on top of it, every single time that you are linking to that page, to that contact page, let's say you have a hundred blog posts and all hundred blog posts go to that contact page. Then Google thinks that is an important page because you have linked to it a hundred times. Right. So by not doing that, you're de-emphasizing the fact that the contact page is important and technically right. It is, we want people to contact us, but in Google's eyes, we never want somebody landing on that website. We want, or generally speaking, nobody's going to really just outright contact us. So it's not really a great user experience. So I always say, just put the form right at the bottom of the page and then the internal linking where, where pages are going put them towards your important pages, like your service page, or maybe there's a, a really hot topic on your blog that that is something that you want to give more weight to. Yeah. And I think that's great because I, you're right. Like you want people to kind of experience you, learn a little bit about you, see what it is that you're doing before, you know, because that's the whole idea of your webpage is sort of filter those people out from just going, oh, sure. Like I'll just fill this form out, send me information. And you know, they, they shop a little bit so they know what the they're looking lose. for. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So what, you know, let's talk about, um, you know, the other side of it. Cause we've talked about like some simple stuff that you can, you know, you can do. What are some of the, you know, things that people have done that you're like, Ooh, that's like a bad habit that you have to get out of. Hmm. The bad habit for SEO is probably putting the same information on every single page and thinking that using the keyword multiple times on a page is going to make a difference and, uh, or not doing a blog at all. Those two things are probably the biggest ones that I have seen. Okay. 
So let's talk, uh, you know, I think I want to talk a little bit more about the blog page because I think people sort of get it in their head of like, I'm not a writer, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, you know, this isn't something that I publish all the time. So when somebody is thinking about doing a blog, let's say like a, a service based business, um, mm -hmm. what are some things that, you know, they should concentrate on how, how long should a blog be like those kinds of, of details? Cause I think people are like, how many words do I have to write? Right. <laughs> Cause this is going to be a book. <laughs> yes. That is a great question. That is the most common question. It's like, how long does a blog have to be? And the answer is there is no answer. So <laughs> sometimes you even find people on the first page where they don't even have hardly any words at all. They just have like slideshows. But generally speaking, just so that I can give people a starting point, what I say is do something that is 800 words or more. And that's only because there is no set guideline from Google. But what I have felt is that anything less than 800 really feels just surface level. It doesn't feel like it's giving enough substance to the person reading the article of whatever they're looking for. So if you have something at least over 800 words, it has some substance to it. Now, there are some studies out there and there's some people that talk about, oh, the longer the number of words, the better, the higher ranking. Well, it just so happens that there's a ton of other factors that rank into that. And really what's happening is that there's more context for Google to better understand and then serves up those longer ones because it just keeps, there could be like they've been on the page longer or there's just more context around the, the topic that they're talking about. So it's not that there's any specific word count, just do what feels like would answer the topic question. So, and then you do the 11 points, which I know you'll you'll put on there. There's, there's some things that you can do on the page, generally speaking that like the title that has the keyword, you put your words in the body inherently, that's going to make a difference. You add images, you make it so that when they land on the page, it's engaging. So they don't wanna just jump off right away. Um, sometimes you can put some like techie schema code in the back for some pages and there's tools that help you do that. So it doesn't have to be all like, oh, I need to learn code or anything like that. But um, those are some of the things. So. If somebody is, you know, and, and I am going to link, cause I think that's an important episode that gives you a lot of like, just like small little things that I think you can go ahead and start doing your, you know, yourself on one of them, you had talked about, um, you know, kind of giving yourself a couple of weeks, you know, to, mm. to go in, um, you had talked about, um, the, uh, going into the uh, Google search console, um, mm -hmm. and, and sort of doing that. Let's talk about that so that people can kind of see like, Oh, can I, can I make a difference as I'm doing this? Cause I think sometimes yes. they go, I don't know. <laughs> yes, exactly. So there's a tool called Google search console. It is free and it gives you the exact keywords that people are finding your website for. So you don't need an SEO tool per se. They all have their, um, quirks. I have a whole thing on that one because there's like lots of differences, but Google search console is straight from Google and it tells you when, where you show up on page one, how many times people see your page off of specific keywords, and it will tell you how many times people click to your website from it. And then it gives you like um, the graph overall. So you can see it for like the last 12 months to see if there's like a dip in seasonality or if something all of a sudden drops off because maybe there's an algorithm change or something like that. Um, one of the things that people wonder is when they make changes to their website, how long does it take? And it, I, I hate saying this, but it does depend because there's so many variables. So with Google itself, it might see it right away, like page titles and page descriptions, it kind of can see and process more sooner than later. But there are times where depending on the algorithm and how they're deciding what to show first, they go through their whole like streamline of changes, right? So if they haven't yet decided that type A1 is a ranking factor, but now all of a sudden two months later they do. And then four months later, it finally goes into production. That might finally be seen on your page where it wasn't there before. So that's something, I don't know if that made sense, but to, yep. to keep in mind. Um, so I usually say a good rule of thumb is two weeks. So you make some changes, see if in two weeks, anything makes a difference. If you don't see anything happening, then it's kind of like, okay, well, do you want to do like four weeks? Maybe it maybe it'll take a little longer. 
I just go by gut and two weeks, four weeks usually sounds good. And then I get impatient and then I'm like, all right, let me try something else. <laughs> and then right. I just keep track of it in a Google doc, basically. Yeah. So for those people that are, you know, have, l- let's say they've, they've went and listened to your episode of the 11 steps, they've implemented it. They've waited their two or four weeks. They're kind mm-hmm. of seeing some changes, but they're like, I want to see more, you know, what type of businesses do you like, do light you up that you really love working with? And what are ways that people can, um, sort of get your help to, to go ahead and, um, optimize their SEO a bit better? Yep. I love working with service-based businesses. So anybody who is passionate about their business, they're ambitious about their business. They love doing what they do. If they love what doing what they're doing, then I love helping them. So there's not any particular industry outside of service-based usually. Um, and the easiest way to find me is compassdigitalstrategies.com. There's a free website marketing starter kit on there. There's an SEO planner on there. Um, I do have a program that if somebody wants to come in, we can get them all set up with their SEO content strategy so that they can go off running with it themselves. They don't have to be strong armed into like some 12 month contract or something like that. So, well, we'll make sure we have all of the links to where everybody can, you know, listen to that episode, but as well contact you. And if you had one, one thing that you think people should go and do right now, Mm -hmm. what would that be? hands down the site colon domain.com thing. Just take a look and see how Google and how other people are seeing your website. You'd be surprised at how much opportunity there is to really just change a couple things and then wait and see what happens. And it it could, like if you pick something from page using Google Search Console, you can see what's on page two, change a page title or description, wait a couple weeks and see if it jumps up to page one. It's not guaranteed, but that's a, a good low hanging fruit. Well, and I think sometimes it's a good sort of eye opener too for entrepreneurs to go, oh, I didn't realize that's how people were finding me. Because yes. sometimes it is a little shocking, right? We get it in our head what they're looking for, but they come to us in, you know, different ways or they're searching for different, mm-hmm. you know, different words. And that can help you also to go, oh, okay, if, if this is how everybody wants to find me, so be it. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time today, Barb. I know that, you know, I've been deep diving on your podcast and learning a lot. And there's been a lot of even light bulb moments where I was like, oh, I got to keep doing that again. So I'm going to make sure I link to um, my two favorite episodes that I want you guys to listen to and as well as the checklist so that you guys can start doing this, do a little bit of DIY. And then if it's not going the way you do, make sure that you reach out to Barb and get that help so that you can just just shoot and hit the stars sooner rather than later. Understanding how to work with SEO seems convoluted and frankly can be another language. What I love about Barb and the more I've been, you know, getting to know her and experience different things like her podcast, her website, all of her blog posts and everything is that she really does take the fluff out of it. It's easy steps that you can start to do yourself right away. Um, She talks about things like images, your your URL, your page titles, your body copy, calls to actions, some adding engagement points, um, internal links, links to outside pages, publish dates. These are all things that she talks about that are really easy. And some of them can be super quick for you to start implementing right away to start seeing changes. It is a topic that's heavy, but it's one that as every business owner, especially today in business, we all need to start doing. And if you are one of those people who are like, you know what, this is just not something that excites me. That's why we have people like Barb. Barb is so excited and enthusiastic when she gets to help people and to just engage and help them start seeing a difference. So I encourage you to head to the show notes, find all of the ways that you can learn more about all of her knowledge for DIY stuff, as well as ways that you can go ahead and work with her so that you can get, you know, that super boost on your SEO right away. 
And I really want you guys to start sharing some of the changes that you've made and some of the things that you're starting to notice. We're going to start featuring you and your website when you start implementing this so you can get even more reach, you can get even more notice, and we're going to link it all on our page for this. So make sure that you message me on any one of our social medias or on our website. Let me know what you did. Let me know the results that you saw, and we're going to help boost that ROI for you because we are all here to collaborate together. So I'm excited to hear all of the stuff that you guys learn. And no matter what it is that you're doing today, as I always say, make sure you take time to have fun because if you're not having fun, why are you doing it? <laughs>